It's kind of a long lag there. Uh, we are now live. This is Journeys in Podcasting, and it's a afternoon edition. Today, we're going to be talking to Dr. Kerry Rossett. I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Yeah, that's great. Uh, and I think we're predominantly going to be talking about um, this uh, combining uh, peer relations from the classroom with goal structures. And, and we're looking at the, the revisit meta study of the Johnson & Johnson report on individualistic I hope I get these three right. Individualistic, cooperative, and and competitive uh, goal structures. Um, so, uh, Dr. Russ, could you just kind of give a brief introduction of how you came into research after I think you said you were teaching for ten years in a boarding school, and then how you came into contact with the Johnsons? Yeah. So I um, uh, coming out of college, I had a year before I started medical school and so I was I uh, got a job teaching Spanish in a boarding school and coaching soccer and skiing and playing tennis in the spring and uh, I thought this was the greatest transition into adult life ever you know I get to do all these things and they pay me not much but it but still a little um, but the plan was to go to medical school um, and nine years later I was still there and and what kept me there was I just became increasingly fascinated with um, the, the way I watched uh, peers influence each other as they came into boarding school and went through their four years. And so uh, you, could, you could know a lot about a kid and, and um, what's going on in his life and, and, and how he's changing or she's changing um, based on who they were hanging out with. Um, and then... Uh, in a boarding school, you get to see that in, across different peer groups. So they might be in my Spanish class, and I see them in one group of peers, and then we go out to the soccer field, and I see them in a different group of peers, and, and I'd watch the same student behave very, very differently in these different peer contexts. And so that's, that was fascinating to me. It was, too, uh, it was too systematic to be random, and I wanted to understand why that was happening, and, and could you leverage those things for, for positive outcomes? And so... Uh, long story short, I, uh, coming back to graduate school for me was a, a, a way of pursuing answers about those social psychological processes that were that were resulting in those transformations. And, and sometimes they were good transformations, and sometimes they were bad in the sense of, you know, kids making choices that um, weren't necessarily in their best interest. But uh, I felt like for for schools and for teachers and for students, if um, uh, this was just too powerful to ignore, and if you could harness it, it would be a really um, amazing way to uh, to take advantage of, of what was already happening. And, and by that, I mean, um, in, in especially in middle school and high school, um, you know, we know our students are, are very oriented towards other students. Um, uh, they're, they're very, very focused on their peers. And so there's no getting around that. It's a developmental process. It's, it's very important to, to becoming an adult. And so rather than fight against it in the classroom, you know, uh, eyes on your own paper, don't talk to your neighbor, um, these sort of constant things that we say to students to, to keep them from interacting to each other. Um, what, what fascinated me was could we, they want to do it anyway, could we have it focused on academic work in a way that could be really productive? Um, and so that's how I found my way into the, the line of research that I work on now. Yeah, I'm... Um in Bogota at the moment, but I, I've spent six years working in, in Barranquilla at Colegio uh, Carlsi Parish, and the Costeña culture is very talkative, to say the least. Yeah. And, and so what I was finding, which I think is very similar to what you're talking about, is that the students just had to talk. Like, like it was going to happen whether you allowed it to or not. And exactly. so my goals were to sort of try to harness that and leverage it within the classroom of giving them tons of talking space but kind of doing the cognitive loading, the, um, the I call it front loading, I don't really know if there's a technical term for it, but getting them so hyped up thinking about something and then releasing them to go speak about it. And then they could spend you know two to three minutes just like hashing out their ideas. And this seemed to be really effective, just leaving these talking spaces in there. Um, I, I see how you kind of came to, by peer observations, uh, looking at a boarding school where a learning system can really develop the same kids go to school together in the same classes over time. Very similar to the kind of schools I've been working in, uh, in the international schools where these kids know each other from pre-kindergarten and they're going to know each other through their adulthood. Um, so those patterns within that system and that social development get developed really young. Um, I 
came to think about this more um, through Vygotsky's um, activity theory or what developed out of Vygotsky, I guess is cultural historic activity theory. Um, and I, I was really attracted to this, how it kind of like cast a wide net uh, over the, what I call the catalytic tools within a learning environment, the, the social construction of knowledge, and maybe even considering Bandura's idea of self-efficacy and the modes of agency of independent proxy and, and communal. Um, and then I was wondering how like your work connects with some of the more viral notions within education, like growth mindset from, from uh, I would say Duckworth, but I think that's grit, um, uh, from Carol Dweck, uh, growth mindset, and then uh, Duckworth's grit, that seem more dependent on an individual outlook um, and, and like individual discipline habits, which I think are all within that same system. How do you feel like uh, what you're working on kind of overlaps with all of that? So, um, so I'll give a, a technical answer, and then I'll try to unpack it a little. But um, where, where my work overlaps with that is, uh, is I take very much more of a, a social psychological or situational per perspective on on issues related to, um, uh, for example, self-efficacy. Can I do this thing now? Um, my answer can be very different under different situations, um, and so. Uh, given certain supports and uh, the right um, in, in the right uh, I, I don't have distractions for other things and the like then then my answer to that self-efficacy question could be yes but given other circumstances it could be no um, so within psychology there's this tension between what are uh, personality or, or dispositional factors things that are consistently make me different than you or, or from other people and then those things that make us who we are as individuals and then the, the the recognition that all of us behave differently under different conditions and so there's me with my family there's me here at work there's me with a, um, a senior colleague with a more junior colleague with when i go to the playground and i'm helping out with uh, at my kids school and all of those situations will bring out different aspects of, of who we are as well so the challenge for psychology is always to understand what's the what's the interaction between the things that make us individually different and in, in who we are as individuals but then uh, what about the situation can can uh, can bring about different types of behavior. So, um, whereas the work by Duckworth, uh, Dweck, uh, other goal theorists, for example, thinking about whether students are, are mastery oriented or performance oriented and so forth, um, tend to take a, a more dispositional view of those things. Uh, you're the kind of person that. Um, where my work uh, comes in is, is from the other side of the spectrum saying, can I create different types of situations that make kids more mastery oriented or more performance oriented? Can I create different situations where, um, where kids really demonstrate grit and then in other situations where they, they're, they're not able to? Um, and for me, the reason I, I chose to focus on the social psych aspect of it was both uh, one of interest, but you know, with uh, experience in a boarding school, it seemed to me that I had very little influence on who walked through my door. Uh, but what I did have influence on is, is the situation that those students found themselves in in my classroom or on my team or on my dormitory. So, so for me, it had a real um, applied um, benefit for focusing on the, on the social variables. Uh, um, I want to talk about the time frame of these goal structures because I, I noticed that, uh, you know, in a med, I'm, I'm a little bit familiar with meta study, especially with the the, the mega study of you know making le visible learning. Um, yeah. I, I want to get back to that in a second too. But uh, this idea that I noticed in the original Johnson and Johnson study, they mentioned that the shorter time frames of these cooperative goals had actually had higher indications of of the longer ones. And this was kind of counter to my experience in setting up cooperative learning goals in that to me it's sort of the longer we go the more project-based it is um, the more the kids can have these kind of um, open interaction times to to you know really tap into kind of this idea of a dispersed knowledge network yeah. um, I've had higher success with those or high, higher achievements um, in your study you know th this was also I think you said it was kind of a discrepancy that there was there wasn't real clear data out of the longer or shorter goals what are your when you set up this idea of the cooperative goal um, is time frame a big factor 
It, it is, and so this um, in in time frame can be a big factor in in, in like your what you, you were talking about in your own experience in amplifying a positive effect, um, but a but longer time frame can do the opposite as well. And so the challenge is understanding you know why is it helping in one case and not in the other. Um, so one of the ways that we think about this is in terms of the salience of the psychological environment. So, so Bronfen Brenner has this really nice model of, um, of ecologies and there's sort of the immediate context that I find myself in and that's embedded in these relationships and neighborhoods and the community and culture, et cetera, et cetera. And, um, which conceptually gives us a nice idea that there's, there's many things influencing the way we think about, uh, about any given phenomenon at any given moment. Uh, you and I talking right now, but uh, me being in the U.S. versus you being in Bogota, there's a lot in Bogota. There's lots of different things influencing our perspectives. So salience is is which which of those of those many different sources of influence, which is the one that's really having the most significant effect on our on our behavior at any given moment. So within a short term, what we know is that we're able to make. Uh, uh, cooperative and competitive and individualistic goals very salient and so um, right now you and I are engaged in a discussion but we could say all right let's uh, let's take a break and let's play a game and suddenly you and I will shift from uh, having this discussion where we're trying to understand each other and, and, and create some shared meaning to it's just a game and we're gonna see who's gonna win uh, and, and, and so in the immediate sense, uh, those things can have an immediate impact. And by those things, I mean the goals that we set up for each other, cooperative or competitive, can have an immediate change on behavior. Over the long term, that could be uh, what the other forces that, we're, that are influencing us could either amplify that in a positive way, like the example you were giving. Um, we've, we've known each other for a long time. We have lots of prior experience working with each other cooperatively. Perhaps the norms in my classroom or in the school or in the, the culture that I'm finding myself are very cooperative. And, and all those things could, could be consistent messages about how, um, about how we should work together. Uh, but you can also imagine a situation where uh, we do something cooperatively, but the message in my class is uh, only a few kids are going to get A's. And so you're going to cooperate right now, but actually this is a very competitive environment. Or you see this very often in universities. Um, yes, this is an introductory uh, chemistry class, but you know, to get into the pre-med program, only the top students are going to be able to do it. So, so there's conflicting messages that students are going to receive where if we want to predict their behavior in the moment, I can do that by way of uh, understanding cooperative and competitive goals. But if I want to predict their behavior over the long term, uh, it's that congruence or incongruence with the other th messages that are that we're receiving that can that can either enhance or dampen the effect, if that makes sense. So what we find in the meta analysis is is when we look at long term studies where they've measuring things over years, that the effect sizes tend to decrease. And and we think what's happening there is there's just so much more going on, you know, in terms of uh, influencing behavior that that's. Um, that's what's having the dampening effect on the on the outcome. And, no, this totally makes sense, and this is I think what we were talking about very briefly before about um, setting up these cooperative goals, but within structures within schools or universities, um, which are very dependent on the individual measurement. You know, yeah. uh, the big complaint from the K through twelve environment is it's very difficult to innovate and create these kind of portfolio assessments and group assessments when at the end of the day you know that they have to take this standardized test, you know they have to pass these AP courses in order to like look qualified for the you know upper upper ed system. Um, what about this idea of a, a I'm going to use a big German word, a Weltanschauung, which is I guess the world view, that w when um, you're working with teachers, I, I have had the luxury of getting to work with 18 different teachers over the, the last five years, and each setting would be drastically different you know right. even though we go to the same workshops and we subscribe supposedly to the same reading program the lucy calkins the, the tc uh, program um, and have this goal of creating these learning events these kind of critical events which are very very similar to project-based learning and makerspace learning as well um, to me it was totally dependent on what the world outlook or the belief system was 
of the teacher and the, that I was going to be co-teaching with, that I had to really kind of come in and feel them out and really have a discussion with them about um, what they thought should happen in a critical event and, and whether, you know, a more collaborative open goals were an acceptable thing we could pursue or if, um, you know, some just had this very efficient linear method they were used to teaching and it was the, just the fastest way to get this thing, sh you know, a, a accountability system to show that it was taught and get the grade in the grade book. So to step back from that and create these kind of larger outcomes in a learning environment could sometimes be quite a challenge. W what are your thoughts or experiences on the actual belief system of teachers and the ability to affect this, uh, this idea of a cooperative goal system? Yeah, I mean, it, it's, uh... I felt you were, you were triggering memories of, for me of, uh, you know, faculty, faculty room discussions and faculty meeting discussions in the boarding school and, and also triggering a memory of, of why I went back to research or why I decided to become a, a research professor in the sense of um, the, the, the situation that you're describing where you're going to this, this meeting or this, um, this training or what have you and you bring these different perspectives um, that's inevitable, right? We 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 bring think we we should we bring different values based on um, the way we were raised, different experiences we have, um, different goals that we might have for the students we're working with, and um, in just in in making sense of information, uh, it it's it, it's 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 more often the case that there's going to be some disagreement um, than just sort of perfect symbiosis in how two people see those things. And, and to me, that's always a good thing in the sense of I, I, I can learn a lot from that and it challenges me to, um, to really think through my own assumptions and, um, and, and to bring in new ideas. So it's not, it's not a bad thing by any stretch, but as it relates to should I change the way I teach, um, it gets, it, it's, it's one of those things that I think you're not going to win this argument or you're not going to persuade people purely by just uh, um, arguing for, for my values versus your values um, to the extent that uh, at, the, at the end of the day, uh, I think that's where science can be very helpful is, uh, okay, we've got these different views, we've got these different values that, we, um, that, we, that, that inform our teaching, but if we set up this particular lesson in this way, what happens? And, and then we, we, we do the experiment, we have an independent variable, we have careful controls, we repeat it. And so there's replication across many samples, many students, and, and when you start to see um, the same outcome across ages, classes, countries, decades, you, you have strong, I don't know, there, you can't argue with the, the sort of the, the accumulation of evidence that suggests that this is part of what makes us human. When our when my goal aligns with your goal, when my success depends on your success and your success depends on my success, then what the research suggests is that we will interact with each other in a particular way. I'm gonna help you because it helps me. And you're gonna help me because it helps you. Uh, I'm gonna to try to understand your perspective because doing so is gonna help me accomplish the goal and you're gonna do the same because it accomplishes the goal. But if, we, uh, but if our goals are in contrast where my success depends on your failure, then we're gonna interact differently. I'm going to um, ignore your point of view because it's not really relevant. I mean, I might actually uh, try to obstruct your progress because your success means my failure. And but anyway, that the um, the the way our goals align then has these consistent effects on the way we relate to each other. So to circle back to your question, what is it? What do we do with teachers' beliefs about these different issues? I, I'm married to a first grade teacher. My mom was a teacher. You know, the, there, there's going to be these different views on, on what's, what's right and what's not important. But as a, as a researcher, I, I, I really believe in the value of data and, and these repeated experiments to, to, to help guide our thinking on these issues. Um, and, I, and I hope that's where the, the sort of research-based decisions can come in and inform those discussions. Well, yeah, as you're talking, I'm kind of going off in different directions, but also coming from multi-generations of teachers and everyone in the family having taught at some point, um, and we actually had sort of schools set up after school where a mother would um, have cooperative groups set up, you know, in the dining room. And yeah. 
you know, her strategy, we would just be watching this happen kind of all the time. Her strategy was the one room schoolhouse that she may be working with this small group over here while this student is helping this student over here. Um, you know, so it was just kind of something automatic. Another thing we, we mentioned really briefly before we started was this idea of the mode of production, the product of learning, that when it is a um, constructivist and constructionist output that, that can sometimes lead to a, a greater idea of collaboration. I recently visited a, a makerspace here in Bogota where they, um, they work with kids out in the countryside in the campo and with university students here in the city and sometimes bring in professors from the MIT lab as well. And, and they work together on solving some construction problem out in the countryside and, and it kind of breaks all barriers of class communication you know all these things are happening very automatically because they have this constructionist concept to work on so yeah. that's kind of a, a fascinating area i think to to delve into as well um i know you're at msu and watching time because i really want to get a couple of questions in and and um I think you're at a very interesting university, one because it's at the forefront of ed tech innovation and in education, another because uh, of the special education department and the potential bridging across those two areas. And those for me have always been this idea of learning system of really deconstructing it. When you throw a new tool into a learning system like a few iPads or um, you know we're going to make a video or we have this other thing that we're going to make in our literacy project it really changes this idea of who the leaders uh, are that emerge in the classroom and, and how we really think about kids working across different modalities and different social groupings, you know, watching kids just become the leader because all of a sudden we're doing something kind of techie or they get to enter a Minecraft world and they become the professional. It yeah. pulls out all of these, um, these peer relationships in the, in the classroom that, that we weren't seeing at, at other times. Um, and yet, here's the problem part, um, my experience with technology education is that it's a giant substitution, that we're merely making things so much more accountable that um, it's actually framing teachers' work even more structured so that they have less and less space for creativity of looking at things like collaborative learning products um, because of, you know, the first thing to come in is high accountability on grade input on high, and, and it's very individualistic, like we're measuring different students, even getting into kind of psychometrics that you know, how many minutes did you spend reading this text last night? How many answers did you answer correctly? Uh, what are your thoughts on those two areas? Yeah, there's a, there's a lot in your comment. Um, I, I can just, I'll, I'll pick up one aspect and then if you want me to, to talk about another, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to do so. But um, I, I, think, I think one of the major selling points, at least, uh, at least people try to make it a selling point of working with technology is that we're gonna have so much more um, in the moment knowledge about what students are actually doing, right? So you, you mentioned how much time did you spend reading? Which of course we all know is uh, just the server logging that I clicked on something. It doesn't mean that I was actually reading it or, or interacting with it. Um, uh, uh, in that we can, that we can have a sense of, of the learning process because of, of how students navigate through this piece of technology that we, we've offered them. And, and so in an online world, that's very often the website as they move through the content as it's laid out and so forth. Um, so what do I think about that? Uh, we, we just finished a, a, a three semester study where we helped a professor flip his, his large lecture for anatomy and physiology. So he put all his lectures online and then the goal was, was to um, engage his students in much more cooperative, active, act, active learning in the, in the classroom. Um, so when we looked at the, uh, we call it trace data, the data of what the students were doing with these lectures, uh, we, we saw what we worried about, which was this, it looked like a ski slope. You know, at the beginning of the semester, they would, they would click on the lectures, and then by the end of the semester, uh, the number of students who were actually watching or clicking on the lectures was, 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 was much lower. Uh, we look, you could see how much time they were spending, or at least that the video was open. We're, we're hoping they're watching it, but at least it's open on their screen, and that was decreasing as well. Uh, so, so none of that was very informative, but, but then we could look at it in terms of students who did well in the course, and we saw very different trajectories. So uh, no matter how well they did, uh, the students, or no matter who the students were, all of them decreased across the semester, but the students who got A's stayed, their, their uh, slope or their, their, the speed at which they decreased over the semester was, was rather shallow. 
And we see the students who um, didn't do well in the course started at about the same level as the students who got A's, but then they quickly dropped. And so what the, the data tell us there is, is, is only informative to the extent that uh, for us, we think, all right, motivationally, what's happening for those students who aren't doing well, that they just, they just dropped off? Um, is it uh, that data doesn't tell us anything except that it's happening? Uh, but when it does tell us is it's happening differently for those students than it is for the students who are doing well. So it helps us to target in that there's for a group of students, is there something that we can do that would, that would change the, the, the speed at which they disengage from the course? Um, so, so that's a, a long-winded answer to say, I think that the, the data do have some meaning that we can get from the technology uh, in, in focusing our attention on particular groups of students. But the hard work of actually helping them uh, either to continue what they're doing or to not to is, is not going to come from the technology itself. It's, it's just, uh, it's just a taking a temperature, if you will, of what's going on. Yeah, uh, I mean, uh, when I was in charge of kind of overseeing the integration of technology in third through fifth grade, um, the two things that I immediately jumped on, like, oh, we've got these new tools, um, modality. Now we can have kids thinking across different modalities, capturing their thoughts in multiple formats, a lot more front loading of cognition before they go to write. So we're not just sending them down that, that dark tunnel alone. Yeah. Um, and, and this idea of screen casting to kind of um, get more of this private speech that what a kid will go off and, and, and iterate and iterate uh, an oral presentation into an iPad is, is an incredible product that can then be brought back and shared before the whole class for discussion. Yeah. I agree. Um, and then the other one was, uh, I guess I call, I kind of borrow from the D school, the radical the idea of radical collaboration that, that technologies are offering us is like this incredible outreach and way to comment on each other's work. So doing a lot of training, like something as simple as making a physical Google Doc on the wall so that kids can stick their work, their work up and then post-its become the comment sections and what's a constructive comment, how do we actually give each other meaningful feedback. Um, so, you know, these are the kind of areas we're working on, much less on this idea of kind of like a class dojo or a RAS Kids or one of these um, high monitoring kind of devices that um, gives us all this insight into what's going on with kids in moment to moment. I mean, class dojo can actually be broadcasted out so that parents can be kind of watching what's going on. Yeah. Um, no, so, and all those affordances that you're describing, I think that's the magic of, of the potential of, of technology. And so to, um, it can be very, it can, it can really capture their interest, it can engage them in something that they're going to um, commit to over a, over a long period of time. It, it, it becomes a record that they can, um, uh, you know, a product that they can share widely. Um, it becomes a record that they can come back to at the end of the year and say, what did I do this year? And they've got these things that they can point to. And um, it's just magical in that way. Um, the, the year in Bogota and I'm here connecting people across the world is just another affordance. Um, and so it's, and, and so for me, the um, much like peers can can have both positive and negative effects. So the technology is the same, and the and the trick is, can we can we harness it in a way that's accomplishing our goals for the classroom, um, and and minimizing those other uh, outcomes that we don't want. Uh, Dr. Russell, I would keep you on for the next two hours. Um, I have questions that that go on and on. Um, thank you for for joining us and. Uh, Going through your research, you know, I, I know for practitioners it can be very uh, difficult sometimes to read research as a constructive way of feedback. But one thing that I really got out of it was um, the same idea that we're doing of deconstructing learning environments and then figuring out what are those factors that are working, things that teachers are doing kind of moment to moment, day to day, in the, in their planning and, and uh, you know immediate feedback to kids. But uh, it was fascinating to see how it's being deconstructed at uh, kind of a data collection level. Um, very, very interesting stuff. Yeah, well, thank you. It was great to talk, and uh, we didn't get to it, but I think the I think the next the whole new world is is this question of boundaries. You know, uh, in the online world, is there is there something that that happens when we're interacting through these online technologies that that our psychology works differently? Um, so so right now we have a live uh, face to face, even though we're separated by by distance. Um, 
that's a very different experience than if I, you send an email to me and it takes me two days to respond or we're, um, or uh, we, we never got to see each other face to, uh, you know, see each other react to each other's comments in a way that's, oh, he's listening or that sounds supportive or he looks interested, um, all these nonverbal signals. And so I, I, that to me is a sort of next, the new frontier as we think about these issues because um, the kids today, they're, they're, they're going to be connected to their devices forever. What is it yeah. that they're going to experience that's going to be, that's going to operate differently than the, um, the world up to this point? It's really um, fascinating. Yeah, in preparing to, to talk to you is very difficult because your research uh, spans a lot of different, different areas, but one of the areas was this idea of early childhood and, and conflict resolution. And so I spent a little time over the last months looking at this idea of proxemics, just how we physically design classrooms and how the, the giant advantages of, of uh, bringing everybody in close into kind of this this uh, uh, campfire environment where uh, gesture, affect, facial expression, all these things come much more into play than trying to capture this kid's attention that is you know clearly on the other side of the room that in, in his foveal vision you're actually just a little dot. Um, but, but when you can actually kind of bring everyone closer and so especially with early childhood uh, I think it's um, incredibly important. The, the interesting part, which I, I don't really have a, a way to frame exactly, just that with all this connectivity, you know, for us here in Bogota, this is a, a godsend. Like, you know, just 10 years ago, I had to go and rifle through used bookstores in the States to get, you know, get enough books that it would kind of last me the year to come back and then study. And now it's sort of like everything's right there at your fingertips, not only for research purposes and reading, but you could actually, you know, for people that are open to connecting and, and coming on the podcast, for example, it, yeah. it brings this whole new world of kind of uh, social interaction and, and construction, constructive kind of, of actions. If that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, no, it makes the world a smaller place, and it's. Um... I, I I wish that there were more. Um, I guess kind of digest of the research. You know, like like I see them on the MSU page. There's great every time you guys have a publication. There's an article about it. But these are fascinating things for practitioners out in the field, you know, just kind of bring it down to the level so we don't have to try to decipher um, all those math symbols that are in, in, the, in yeah, the data sections. Yeah. We apologize <laughs> for that, yeah. <laughs> all right, well, thanks a lot for joining us. Uh, I hope it would be great to get you back in the future, uh, you know, if, if you can find another time slot. We'd love yeah, that would be great. It was fun. Thank you, and uh, thanks for doing this for everybody. It's, um, it's a great service to the field, and um, I'm impressed. It's a good... It's a, it's, a, uh, it's, it's a great venue and a really effective way to, to reach out and to help bridge that, that gap between what's happening with research and the teacher. So thank you for doing that. Yeah, we hope to do more. Okay. Hey, thanks okay. a lot.